Good evening, everybody. Hello. Thank you for coming. Just checking that the music was off, otherwise I may start singing and dancing, and that's not quite what you <laughs> ordered this evening. Um, thank you very much for coming. Uh, very special that you're here. The, I'm here this evening not necessarily to talk about myself, but it's an ongoing journey, and I was talking with a few of you earlier about it. It's, about, it's a discussion. And what I've started doing is, a, is essentially a catalyst. It's a catalyst, a personal catalyst, a journey I pushed myself into and on of questions I want to answer. But I'm quite happy if people have things they want to throw at me sort of verbally or physically as I'm talking, uh, if not towards the end, because it is a very, very interesting discussion. And I'm not 100% sure of the path that I'm on, but uh, it's a fascinating path. And I want to begin with, um, also if I'm talking, I appreciate English is not necessarily everybody's native tongue here, so if I'm talking too quickly or if I get too enthusiastic, start sort of waving. But is this okay? Yeah. Am I understandable? Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, can you see? Yeah, instead sort of see my profile, okay. Um, I'm going to begin with something very simple, because I'm a little bit of a simple soul, to be honest. This is the uh, opening page of a book I made and published a little over one and a half years ago. The title is uh, written above, there's my name, and what I write in it, for one reason or another, a lot of people have bought it, which is very flattering, and they say, sign your name in it and write something in it. So I thought, I'm never, you know, why do you want my signature? And then I started writing this. It's again very simple. Be inspired by some of the world's last and most beautiful peoples and places. And that's essentially what this is about. But it's extremely important to put it into context, and I'll do that in a couple of uh, cases this evening. I want to begin with this gentleman. Does anybody know who he is? Edward Sheriff Curtis, does that ring a bell to anybody? An extremely important, uh, some of you are probably photographers or interested in photography. If you haven't heard of him, you have to go and research who he is straight away. He's my uh, icon. Uh, he's a photographer, he died in 1952, 53 if I'm right in saying, and at the beginning of the last century, he traveled around central North America and he documented the Native American Indians. And he not only, I've just made one book, he ended up making 30 volumes, 30 colossal volumes uh, of wet plate photography of all the indigenous Native American Indian cultures. And he put them on a pedestal. He celebrated them. He said they're icons, they're extremely important. And he ran around screaming and yelling, making these pictures, saying, look at these people. We have to document them. We have to celebrate them because this is uh, part of our heritage. Uh, he died impoverished. He died divorced. He died in many ways in shame. He died with absolutely nothing, and every single one of his pictures disappeared into a drawer, into a basement somewhere far, far, far away, and he was forgotten. Until about 25 years ago, his pictures emerged, his volumes emerged, and the whole of American culture put their hand over their mouth and went, oh my goodness me, look at what we've had, and look at what's gone, and look at who we've become today. I'm being very, very melodramatic, and I'm speaking very broadly, and I'm not going to actually sort of go into any great details, but this... I'm, in my opinion, was one of the, they are some of the most extraordinary people that ever existed on this planet. But because they were colored, because they were covered in leather, because they had feathers in their hair, because they danced around backwards around the campfire singing strange songs, they were looked upon as being primitive and they were forgotten. Thanks to Edward Curtis and what he did and his passion, he's made the most extraordinary document of them. So they don't exist today. But uh, not only are they the pictures acknowledged for being extraordinary, the Native American Indians that still are many generations further in Central Ameri uh, North America today honor him and respect him for the effort that he did. But it is a directed point of view. It is a point of view, it's a very emotional, very passionate, very subjective point of view, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, so I made, five years ago I set off on a journey. I've essentially been traveling the whole of my life. Some We were talking about it a few minutes ago, it was Lucy. They, Lucy was saying, when did you start? What was your first tribe? Well, there isn't really a first tribe because for the last 47 years I've been traveling and in many of the places I went to as a kid, so I was quite familiar with them. Five years ago, I started a full-time project. I'd been working as a commercial photographer for about 20 years and I decided to essentially go back to my roots and this was my roots, this is my passion, this is my hobby. Who are these people? Where are they? And I chose 35 different indigenous cultures, groups, tribes, it's, sort of, it's a broad uh, term. And I wanted to put them on a pedestal, very simple, much the same as Edward Curtis. I thought these people are fantastic, these people are extraordinary, they're beautiful, they're, they have a wealth that is, goes miles beyond the sort of material wealth that we've accumulated. And I want to uh, present them in an iconic way. So I went off on a journey. 
Uh, it was a wild journey. I'll share a few of the stories with you in a minute about that journey. But I'm going to go back up until about a year ago. A year ago, a little over a year ago, I published the book. All the pictures came into it. And um, this happened. And I think thanks to the sort of the, the world of uh, online uh, media, the pictures were picked up, the story was picked up, and the, we were published in more than 4,500 magazines around the world on paper, and then many tens of more thousands of blogs and discussions, and if you go online, it's unending. And I was shot. I had no idea what I'd started. Uh, then thereafter, because it was published, the whole world essentially came to me and started to say, well, we want to ask you a question. And to be honest, uh, questions for answers which I didn't have. Who are you? Where are you? Why? What is this? Who is this? Who are you? You have zero. We were talking about a minute ago. You don't have any qualifications to have this opinion. Who are they? Where? How did you find them? This is not true. Before they pass, say, well, that's a load of bullshit. Nobody's passing away. So a massive great discussion, a fascinating discussion. And in actual fact, a discussion which took me to the source of, okay, what are all these pictures about? What did they mean to me? And perhaps what could they mean to us? Uh, the discussion went so far, and we can ha carry on the discussion later, because I think it's fascinating, that we had, um, talking about contemporary media, within three months, 250,000 likes or friends or whatever you call them. I have a young lady who's looking after it next to me on Facebook. Apparently, that's a lot in a short period of time. And then two days after that, uh, we were banned from Facebook because I was uh, peddling tribal pornography. Uh, which was one of the discussions, absolutely fascinating. So this massive sort of, you say in Dutch, heri about Jimmy the pornographer, and, he's the, and then, we got, then we got back online after much debate, then people started posting pictures like this. And then uh, it got even further, we were talking about it a few minutes ago, um, I started to get criticized quite heavily online. If you go online at the moment, I would say 95% of it's very positive, but there is a very, very sort of strong voice criticizing me. And we'll talk about that again in a bit, all the way right down to wrong-headed obsession with vanishing indigenous uh, peoples. Now, uh, wrong-headed is not, and we'll discuss that at length, but obsession it is. And that's essentially what I want to talk about this evening. So this is the cover of the book, and it's a, an iconic document. It's a subjective document, it's a personal document, it's extremely romantic, but it's the truth in, in, through my eyes. And... I think the simplest way of describing it, uh, it's, it's meant to be iconic. And if you sort of analyze, you can talk at length about what icons are, but I've simplified it with these two examples. This is how iconography began, and this is how it is today. And that's fine, and that's valid, and it is. It's sort of through the, as mediums have evolved through the centuries, our icons have evolved. But I thought it was time we went back to what I perceived as my icons and that are these uh, peoples, tribes, and cultures, which we're going to talk about. Why, and going back to the obsession, the obsession is very important. Um, the obsession started for me as a teenager. I um, grew up abroad in the third world as a kid, went to a Jesuit boarding school for many years, and at the age of 16, I had a rather interesting experience. I was traveling backwards and forwards from strange parts of the world, many war zones, and you name it, and I arrived back at 16 from Sierra Leone in a boarding school in Lancashire. And I was very ill. I had cerebral malaria. Have any of you had malaria? It's, it, it's, you know, and then malaria of the brain. So it's, it's sort, of, sort of malaria with bonus points. And um, I was not very well. And my parents said, well, the holiday's almost finished. And I said, yeah, but I'm not well. You know, and, and he said, isn't it, can I stay at home? No, 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 no. Those priests we're paying a lot of money to, they'll go and look after you. And I was saying, but you know, I wouldn't mind you just keeping me here. And my parents, bless their cotton socks, were incapable of doing that. And they sent me back. So I arrived back very ill, but I think, to be honest, very stressed, uh, emotionally stressed, uh, feeling abandoned. And um, somewhat under the weather, as you'd say in English, uh, one of the priests came up to me, and they've all been friendly for many, many years in many different ways. It's another discussion. And he said, oh, he said, oh, my hobby is medicine. If you take this nice big pot of pills, everything will be fine in the morning. So I sort of took these pots of pills, and I woke up the next morning with no hair. Um, I suffered from alopecia totalis, complete hair loss. As you can see, it hasn't grown back. My kids say, but Dad, you're just getting old. Half of Amsterdam, where I live, is bald. And you're right. <laughs> they are. If you go into a bar, all the other 47-year-olds have no hair as well. But when you're 16, it's quite a moment. 
it's quite a moment of confrontation, of visual confrontation, of judgment. You go to bed as Jimmy and you wake up and you feel like Jimmy, but everybody looks at you in a completely and utterly different way. And immediately your life changes. Because, and then you start screaming, saying, no, 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 I'm the same person as yesterday. And everybody who's looking at you goes, no, 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 you're somebody completely different, purely based on your visual appearance. And it's fascinating. It's wildly confronting. 16 is a, I mean, we're all adults now, but go back to that age, that, that very, very, I mean, my son at the moment is 16. It's a very, very, very delicate age. Being on your own in the middle of nowhere, your parents are on the other side of the world, and you wake up looking like my wife said when I met her, an alien. Um, <laughs> But the, the, the journey was interesting. So at the age of seven, I finished school at 17, and I uh, was reminded of this gentleman. I think it's quite, as we're in Brussels this evening, Tintin. Um, literally, I remember reading Tintin as a kid, and I remember seeing pictures of him running around the Himalayas, chasing lots of little bald people. And I thought, well, where in the world can I go to fit in? And I disappeared at the age of 17 to Tibet. I bought a one-way ticket, I stuck my middle finger up to the world, especially my parents and the Jesuit priests, and I disappeared in 1986. Tibet had only been open one year, it had been shut for, technically for 30 years, and I got lost into Tibet. I dressed in red robes, and I wandered from one end until the other. I didn't explore, I, I didn't, uh, there was no deliberate preconceived idea about what I was doing, I was just livid. And I wanted to empathize, I wanted to make contacts, and I wanted people to see me for who I was, not necessarily how I looked like. Is everybody following? Yep. So that's very much how the story began. Uh, I spent a year there, um, uh, wow, it's bleached, doesn't matter. Uh, came back, had been given a very little old camera, I spoke about it by my father, I had four rolls of, uh, as we're in a photography hotel, coat of color gold. Uh, I didn't know anything about photography, I remember reading the back of the box, the sun, the moon, the stars, and the rain, and setting the camera. Mm -hmm. Had a few pictures, they were published, was given a little bit of pocket money, and I disappeared again. And that's how my, uh, essentially my career as a photographer started. Uh, many years in between, five years ago, I started on this journey. This journey of going back to where essentially I began, back to where I felt, back where I felt I belonged. And that was with these uh, indigenous groups and these tribes. 35, often people ask me, how did you choose them? I'm not an anthropologist. I have zero qualifications in this field. I haven't been to school since I was 17, literally. And uh, they were chosen by, purely from an aesthetic point of view, from a geographical spread around the world. Uh, there are 35 here, I'm starting part two, there will be another 35, and it's trying to show the world in a sort of kaleidoscopic, kaleidoscopic way, the nature they live in, the environment they live in, how they look, but it's not based necessarily on their <coughs> their secretary angles, their um <coughs> losing my English. Their um their um yeah the word's gone. Uh the um the um their vulnerability, vulnerability. <coughs> um it's purely a visual and aesthetic document. And uh he's behind you, yeah. <laughs> And what's extremely important, we were also talking about minutes ago with Lucy, is how, um, how I see them and how they see me. And I need, to, this is a little bit of theater. This is the beginning of a story. So I need someone as an example. Can you, sorry, what, what's your name? Gareth. Gareth, can you come and stand up here, Gareth? Sorry. Okay. This is a very simplistic way of approaching. For me, if you come and stand here out of the image, it's about communication. Going back to that story as a kid, how do you see me? How do I see you? I'm, to be honest, I'm not overly interested in photography, but I'm absolutely fascinated how we communicate. The years have gone on, early 40s, and I end up in Papua New Guinea. I'm essentially in an area where these people, the huli behind me, are, are traditionally cannibals. Now, they don't go around eating all in sundry, but they do eat people in a ceremonial way. I've arrived here. This is an extreme story talking about making contact. These people do not want me there. They have no idea what's in this box. I'm using a 4x5, 10x8 technical film camera. I'll talk about that in a minute. But they don't want me there. So I remember arriving and of the years, the only way to actually learn to initially communicate, because you, the translators didn't work, as you arrive and you become extremely small. Uh, you become so small, you become vulnerable. You become so vulnerable that they literally kick you, they shove you, they poke you, they spit at you, they throw dirt at you. And in this particular case, I spent about a week indirectly sitting as a ball on the floor of this village in a very, very sort of uh, vulnerable uh, way. As the week went on, the interest sort of dissipated and they started walking away. But at the end, there was one individual who was vaguely curious. And let's say you're him today. 
And we started making eye contact, and he started looking at me, thinking, what is this strange person from another valley, as they would keep calling it, doing sitting on the floor? There's no way I'm ever going to be able to talk to him uh, in, in a language. And we started looking at each other, but always being smaller, and then giving him the authority. You've got to come and stand here. Now you've got to stand here, stick your chest out, get strong, you're about to. And then eventually, you sort of crawl up a little bit like a dog would. And then, and then I remember going up and sort of touching him on the arm, and there's this, and then and coming, coming up further and saying, wow, wow, you're so strong. And it doesn't matter what language you speak or how you speak, if you, you can find in a body language, and I'm beginning to praise you, I'm beginning to honor you, I'm beginning to worship you. And slowly and slowly, we're looking at each other and going, wow, and I was, you're amazing, wait, 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 have a look. And then I'd sort of go back on my knees and you start looking. And in this box, I had these old technical cameras. Now, the beauty is they have no, no value, nobody uses them anymore. So I'd give you one and you'd look at it, then you throw it over your shoulder and say, it's okay, I've got another one. And then you're talking the whole time, and then you put it on the tripod and you know, it's this sort of plate glass. Any of you ever use them? It's extremely cumbersome and extremely slow. And it's sort of, you're going back to the middle ages, excuse me, of photography. But what's so beautiful about it is because it's so awkward, you become very passionate, you become very physical, you become very sweaty, you become very dramatic, you cry a lot, you shout a lot, you make an enormous amount of mistakes. But in that, you start to communicate, you start showing who you are. And in that, this obsession in seeing you, acknowledging you, worshipping you, honouring you, getting the glass plate straight. Each sheet of film costs 10 euros, so I've only got 30 with me. I've been walking for a month to get to you. I don't just take a thousand pictures with the digital camera and hang in the helicopter with my gloves on with a 300 meter, meter lens and 32 megabyte card, spend the whole time looking in the back of the digital screen. It's about this one moment. So eventually, I sort of see you and I go like this, start looking through the camera and getting closer and the picture, oh, sit up straight. And I eventually start realizing that I'm seeing you. And I start looking, like, wow, you're amazing. Like, that's just like the light, or oh, just hold that, get super, super, go back. Then you're going back and you're focusing, and then you realize, wow, it's too dark. I need light, I need light, I need light. And then eventually, come, 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 you've got to stand up. So you're another hoolie, you've come in now, and a bit more curious. And I come up to you, hi, hi, and I give you a big reflector. And you come stand like that, and okay, and here's that, you've got to hold your scarf if that's a reflector. Like, okay. And again, you've got to shine the sun in there, but you've got to follow the sun, okay? You've got to follow okay. the sun. Oh, there's too many shadows over here. Oh, I need you to come and stand over here. <laughs> Then you come and stand around here, you've got to stand, you've got to get in there, oh, you've got to be good, and you've got to be really good at standing, you've got to bounce the light back then, oh, I need another one here, come quick, quick, quick. And then you've got to stand here, and then before you know it, you've created this human studio. And as you know, in a studio, there's lots of lights and reflectors, but here we are in the middle of the jungle, you're the hoolie, you're the chief, and then there's all these other people standing around with these big silver and gold plates, bouncing light, and we're painting your face. But the beauty is, the sun is moving. So it's manic, so the whole time I'm trying to get you to get all the shadows right. Don't move, I've got legs like this, and you're going backwards and forwards. It takes hours and hours and hours until everybody's in this complete focus and this complete and utter look at your face. And I'm looking, I'm getting in the camera, and everything's right. Don't move, concentrate, concentrate. And you've got a couple of kids here with another reflector and an old granny here. Everybody's looking at you, and oh, keep your back straight. Breathe through your nose, chest out, chest out. Oh, you're strong, amazing, amazing, amazing. And you get down, you get down. And then you think, oh, and you read the line and say, oh, I need five seconds. I need the shutter to open for five seconds. Jesus, oh, okay, five seconds, shh. And you're watching his eyes, you're watching his eyes. One, two, three, four, five. And then when it works and everything's still, and you didn't think, yeah, it's the picture, you're amazing, you're amazing, like this. And then you start hugging me, and everybody's running up and down, jumping and celebrating and clapping, making all their noise. And nobody knows that it's a picture. But we do know we spent hours and hours and hours celebrating you, putting you on a pedestal. Now, what's very beautiful is that two seconds later, somebody else walks in and goes, grunts, says, oh, it's, it's my turn. <laughs> and then they sit down, and then like this, and they sit like this, and they sit like this, and they look in the camera, and they say, dun, 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 like this. And then this goes on, and then you go through the ritual, and you do one, and then the next day you wake up, and there's a whole village from another valley all queuing up outside, because they all want to come and sit in the chair. Thank you, everybody. Please sit down. Now, it could, be, it could be perceived as being patronizing. Um, it's, it's purely about celebration. It's purely about seeing somebody. It's purely about honoring them. And what's very, very exciting is once you've made, and it's about time. I was talking with Lucy about it a minute ago. Traditionally, we don't have time anymore. We run and we run and run. There's always a joke is that they say, you know, we have the watches and they have the time. It's so true. We run and we run and run. If you make time and you invest time to actually get to know them, even though you don't speak the language, you do get to know all the individuals. And then what's very exciting, you take it a stage further. You can't really see this very clearly. But um, you say, well, I want to put these fantastic people in their environment. And the, the, so the motivation behind a picture like this 
is um, its Avatar. And I think four or five years ago, Avatar was in the cinema. It earned three billion euros in the American box office. No film has ever earned more money. And why? Okay, it was entertaining. It was a digital fantasy. I saw it umpteen times with my kids. But um, because it's something we, we feel an affinity to, it's, it's an affinity of going back to the past, getting re in touch with our culture, with heritage, with nature. Here in the middle of Papua New Guinea, they may be yellow, the avatar was blue, but there's not a lot of difference. And the pride that these people have and the way they stand in this extraordinary environment that you see them in. Please have a look at this picture later if either you've got the book or online, because the detail is extraordinary. And then this, again, take, will take another week. We'll look for the right setting, wait for the right light, maybe not make this pitch on the first morning, the first wait into the mist, and the pride and the honor that they have. And then, OK, they don't spend all day dressing wearing these ceremonial hats, but I've communicated to them, please come at your most beautiful, please come at your most important. And this is the end result of what that could be. And then the journey went on and on and on. And this is an extraordinary place. Chukotka, has anybody been to Chukotka? Chukotka is... Um, uh, far, far northeastern of Siberia. It takes 13 hours to get there by plane from Moscow. I mean, it's remote. It's an area the size of France. Uh, it's extremely um, big. Only 80 Chukchis living in Chukotka. We, uh, we found them. We, we spent a month in a tank. It was an amazing journey. We arrived. The guy said, well, I'm not quite sure where they were. We traveled in a tank for a month. And when we got there, we met this guy. Uh, he was the chief, and I was very excited. And you can see, I got out, oh, handsome, 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 light, light, reflectors, reflectors. And he sort of looked at me, and through the translation, he raised the string, and he went, Nyet. And I said, Nyet. And he said, well, you're not going to take any pictures. You're not going to make any film. And I said, yeah, yeah, but I've been traveling one and a half months to come and see you. I've been waiting years to meet these last, you, the last Inuit. And he basically said, well, um, uh, you can join in our existence or you can leave because we live such a fragile existence. It's minus 40 degrees centigrade here. We need you to help us keep us alive and vice versa. And we spent another three weeks living with them. So it's a one, one month journey to get there, many years in planning, and then another three weeks living with them. And then we only ended up taking pictures for two days at the very end. This is the, the Mercy in Ethiopia, uh, southern Ethiopia in the Omo Valley quite a contentious part of the world because when I first went here as a child, it took me a month to get there. I went here five years ago, it took me 10 days to get here. You can now get here in two days from Addis Ababa on a concrete highway. Um, this is one of the last tribes still living there. But with fantastic traditions, you know, the way they decorate their bodies with these uh, scarring and this, the lip plate. It's an amazing, when they, when they enter um, uh, puberty and they become a woman, they pierce their lower lip. And then they put in a small uh, clay plate. And then the larger they get to stretch their lip, come to the age they get married, the more valuable they are and the more worthy they are as, as a wife. And it's about tradition and about heritage. And the mercy are the only people in the world who still do that. But I think there's only about 150 people still living in this uh, part of... And then here's the, the, the Cossacks. Again, these are very... Um, romantic, very idealistic. Um, and there's a story with this which I want to share with you. It's a bit melodramatic, um, but I think it's the antithesis of all what this project is about. It's about making that contact. Um, I spent many days, many weeks making the portraits, as you can see here. And then, I mean, they're beautiful people. They're wildly handsome. They're actually very, very warm. And they're this fantastic symbiosis of man, nature, culture, landscape. And when they enter manhood as kids, when they're 14 or 15, they're encouraged to climb these cliffs and to get baby eagles. They climb them without ropes, without any form of protection, and they spend the rest of their life living and training with that eagle. These eagles are 30 kilos, they have five meter wingspans, and they hunt over these mountains. And this picture has an amazing story, was an amazing story for me with it. Um, obviously, many weeks taking the portraits, and then towards the end, I think I had two sheets of film left, and I just found this valley. And I wanted to ask them to come up there, but again, they had to be very early in the morning, and the light had to be beautiful. And they, they sort of followed me. So the first morning, it was about a three-hour walk to get up there. So we got up at two o'clock in the morning. It's quite a hike, because they were living down in the valley. And it's about minus 20 degrees centigrade, so it's cold. We got there, everything's set up, and you know, the ground is very sharp, and I wanted the white horse in the middle, and it's all a bit manic. And, uh, and then the sun didn't rise. And I thought, the sun is not rising, the sky is very grey, and it's a sort of a, a, 
sort of, uh, my wife would accuse me of being a little bit autistic. Perhaps, perhaps there's an element of truth in that, but it's just not perfect. It's not perfect. It wasn't the way I saw it. It wasn't the way I wanted to communicate it. So I said, we're not going to make the picture. A little bit confusing. We walked down the mountain, spent the whole day begging, oh, tomorrow we'll go and do it again. The light will be beautiful. The next morning we went up. The next morning, again, the light, the sun didn't rise. And I sort of thought, do I make it? Do I compromise? Do I sort of add a sky and later on Photoshop and turn up the contrast? No, it's not the picture that I want. So we went back down. I spent the third day begging them, pleading with them. And the third morning, I sort of, in a, quite a brutal way, I dragged them out of bed dragged them up on top of the mountain. There they were standing, not necessarily reluctantly, but a little bit sort of suspiciously, what on earth is happening? You know, he's not, not actually doing anything here. And it was right. You could see the sky was clear, it was dark, and the sun was about to rise. And I got excited, as you can imagine. I'm exhausted, many months getting there in Fords, three mornings walking up and down the mountain. I've got one shot left, and this is it. So they're all getting there, the light's about to rise, and my camera's on its legs on the tripod and the lenses are attached to a metal plate. And uh, I got a bit excited. I tend to, took off my gloves, went to change the lens, and my finger stuck to the lens. Uh, that's a slight problem. So I'm sort of standing there the third morning, and the guys are looking at me. I'm physically incapacitated. I'm stuck to this camera. And I had a bit of this sort of out of body experience, sort of looking at myself, going, oh, Jimmy, you know, you could be so much easier. Why do you always go so far? And then eventually I said, well, I've just got to take my hands off. So I took my hands off the camera and I left all the skin behind. Uh, they started to bleed. It was, felt like somebody was hitting them with a hammer. And uh, I started to cry. But I started to cry not so much out of pain, because I've had pain before, out of utter exhaustion and despondency and disappointment with myself. Because here, this is the image I wanted to create. This is the image I wanted to photograph. And by being um, neurotic and a perfectionist, I was incapable of doing that anymore. I'd gone beyond my physical boundaries and I was broken. So I was actually crying in self-pity. And I, when you're completely and utterly exhausted, so I was sitting on the floor sobbing on the top of this mountain uh, like a child. And the, one of the guys said, look, look, look behind you. And I sort of turned around and there were these two very large sort of Mongolian women about sort of in their early 60s big hats, big jackets, and they hadn't been there the first two mornings, and I think this was the third morning, so they were very curious, what on earth are these guys doing up there? And, uh, and they be beckoned me over, and I sort of wandered over, and I was you know, crying, oh, my fingers, I'm bleeding, oh, I'm a pitch. And this woman looked at me, she opened her jacket, grabbed my hands, and put them on her breast, <laughs> armpits, breasts, somewhere there in the chest area. And I didn't think about it, so I leant into it. The other woman came behind me, opened her jacket, and she grabbed me, and they enveloped me. And they squeezed me so hard I could take the weight <coughs> off my legs. And uh, I carried on crying, as you can imagine. And I sort of indulged in perhaps the cuddle I'd been looking for for many, many years. Instead, on a at the age of 43, on top of a mountain in Mongolia at 7 o'clock in the morning, minus 20 degrees centigrade with bleeding hands. And I'm sort of b hanging there in this sort of bear hug and these are singing these sort of Mongolian throat songs to me. Like, <laughs> and I'm sort of not really thinking about it. But the whole time thinking, picture, 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 picture. And eventually my fingers, sort of the feeling came back and, um, and I had this one, they were still standing and the wind's blowing and I sort of wallowed over to my camera, functioned in some kind, threw the sheet in and made this picture. Um, great, got it, so wandering down the mountain, wiping the tears away, looking at the state of my fingers. And then I had this sort of moment of reflection, of, wow, something magical has just happened. Uh, this is a Muslim culture. Now, they're not the IS, they're not going to lock my head off, but they are very, very strict Muslim culture. And nowhere in the world, and I've spent a lot of time in this part of the world and other parts of the Islamic world, would you ever be encouraged to either ever look at a woman, let alone be encouraged by the men of the women to go over to them and their behalf be touch them on their chest and be cuddled uh, by them. And I think what had happened was that by being truly open, by being truly uh, emotional, by being truly passionate, by being truly vulnerable, uh, that uh, one human being connected with another. And that's perhaps, if you take the story all the way back to my childhood, the journey that I'm going on is how do we see each other and how do we perceive each other and how do we strip away all these cultural barriers, these uh, uh, forms of identity, and meet each other on, on the level playing field. And that was, for me, a very, very profound experience. But perhaps began to answer why I'm doing what I do, why I do it in such an emotional way, why I do it in such a passionate way, in such a romantic way. These people are extraordinary. They're wildly beautiful. They're wildly proud. And they do have something we don't have anymore. Now, I'm not that anthropologist, so I'm not truly sure what it is. 
But I begin to start having been asked to ask the question myself, what do these pictures stand for? So I'm now returning. And I've been, I started sort of opening my big mouth a few months ago. I said, oh, I'd love to go back. And television companies have started ringing. said, yeah, we'd like to take you back. And we'd like to give you an anthropologist and this and that and translate. So, well, great. So off we went. And I've started going back. And this was the first journey. I went back to the Himba in northern Namibia on the border of Angola. Now, 95, 99% of the Himba have migrated to the cities. They're all wearing like the rest of his T-shirts, excuse me, and jeans. There are very few of the Himba still living in this traditional existence. I mean, these sort of ballerinas of the desert, they have no material possessions whatsoever, but they are prouder. They have straighter backs. They have more beauty and more dignity than many people I've ever met on the planet. And going back to them was a beautiful experience. It's very... Um, and we were talking a minute ago, again, with Lucy about it. Don't, do you ever get the feeling you've stolen something from them? You've stolen their soul? Well, 80 to 90% of them didn't really know what I was doing in the first place. Perhaps I didn't either. They didn't necessarily understand what a camera was. But this process of completing the circle and going back to them, giving them the book, giving them the pictures, and having this discussion with them is very, very, very profound indeed. This whole idea of how did I see you? Is this how you see yourselves? How can they have any idea of having seen themselves if they've never seen a picture of themselves before? What is the discussion? Was it right to put them on a pedestal? How do they perceive themselves with others? And this is a small clip of the uh, first film. And it's a little bit overly sort of melodramatic because of the sake of television. I don't arrive everywhere in a balloon at uh, 6 o'clock in the morning in summer. Right? Um, and it was very beautiful. You sort of right. I do know where they are. I'm pretending to find them, but they were already there anyway. They, um, and when you arrived, it was very beautiful. Everybody went very quiet. And because they had been photographed and filmed before by other people, but nobody's actually gone back and given back what was taken. And it, there was almost sort of shock, and they sort of came up, and then they obviously recognized me very sweetly because I've got a, such a simple name, Jimmy, 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 Jimmy. They kind of remembered who I was. And then there were an awful lot of tears, and then we had a celebration and sort of a party. And then we actually sat down in the evening. I got out the book, and, you know, the, the shock and the horror in a positive way of them looking through the pictures and looking at pictures of themselves and then getting into the discussion, you know, what is this? And then they were looking and then re recognizing themselves and, in some cases, the way I perceived them was correct. In other cases, they said, well, this is wrong, but this is right. And then when you sort of finish the chapter, on, the, in this case, the Himba, you, you would go to the chapter on the Chukchi. And, you know, you, forgetting before, and none of them had any idea of what snow is or where Siberia is. And then communicating them that they're part of this group of 35 people, tribes that I've personally chosen to, to present, to make iconic. A very, very special experience. And here, sort of arriving back, there's one woman you can see in her face in a minute when she sort of realizes she's in it. And her whole eyes light up. And it's fantastic. You could actually actually see their backs straightening and their eyes going wider. And very, very special. And then I went, this was quite a pleasant journey. And then I went, on to, I went to, back to Vanuatu at the beginning of the year. Uh, um, you may have heard about it in the news a few months ago. It suffered from a terrible cyclone. It's um, 83 islands in the Pacific four hours northeast of uh, New Zealand. Uh, here we go. And um, this time I went back with a television crew from CNN. Um, it was a little bit melodramatic because they were all called Bob and they were all eight feet tall and very, very big and very, very loud. Uh, so it wasn't this sort of intimate experience. So, hey, Jesus, Bob, they're naked. You know, so shh, you know, a little bit more respect. <laughs> um, but um, Again, a very, once it sort of calmed down and got used to it, a very special experience. And the last bit you just saw just then, sort of sitting in the tree, and there are 80 of them living in this village. They're called the Yakel. And it was all very exciting. And the chief said, let's make a picture together. So I'm sitting there with that book, as you just saw in the last picture. And then all of a sudden, the whole tree went very, very quiet. And uh, the chief sort of looked at me and said, um, uh, Jimmy, there's a little bit of a problem. And I said, problem, you know, this is in Balawas. He said, well, what's the problem? He said, yeah, well, um, uh, thank you for giving the book. I'm very happy about it. But um, do you realize? And so do I realize what? So everybody in the village is waiting for their book as well. So um, this sort of, you can imagine this picture here, and then all of them, me sitting in them saying, you know, where's our book? So if anybody's going to Vanuatu in the near future would like to come with me with a boat full of books, then um, you're more than welcome to come on the journey. This is a little bit of a lateral story. Uh, this is to trying to put it into context. And I'm often asked, people, I say, well, Jimmy, it's all nice and all great, but what does this mean to us? 
Well, this is a small anecdote and a rather humorous anecdote of what it could mean to us. It's how we see each other. Now, this is my family. Uh, I've been photographing them for many years. I've been harassing them for many years. Um, when they were younger, it went very well. They would listen. I could paint them and stick them in cactuses and hang them on motorbikes and elephants, put them on very dangerous swings, and they did everything <coughs> I wanted to do. But in more recent years, times have changed. Uh, they're now teenagers. Um, this is my son. He's 16. And... Uh, at Christmas, there was a, a sort of a standard family problem. He decided to stop communicating. And so much so, my wife said, well, I'm staying on holiday. You're taking the kids back around because I'm going on a course, a yoga course to find myself, as you've been finding yourself with all these tribes for the last few years. <laughs> I was fine. I'm OK, I'm OK, I'm OK. So I went back to Amsterdam. And um, within th three days, he disappeared. Now, he disappeared. I mean, he was around somewhere, but he wasn't answering his telephone. I think he'd moved in with his girlfriend. And I was beginning to panic. And my younger daughter, my youngest daughter is 13. She's very smart. And she said, um, you know, Dad, you know, are you OK? And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm worrying. And it's not going very well. And then she said, should we ring Mum? And I said, no, 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 we're fine, we're fine. I'm OK, don't ring Mum. We'll sort it out ourselves. Don't tell anybody. And she said, well, can I help you? And I said, yes, please, yes, please. She said, he said to me the other day, he said, I want to become a goth. Do you want a goth? He says, yeah, something about your black. He said, yeah, 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 black. He says, his room's too colourful. He's only got colourful coat. He feels he's become a goth. Is it an idea we take him shopping this evening? You know, we can maybe help him sort of realize that. It's a like, great idea. Where do you say? Well, let's start with IKEA because, you know, at least we'll get fed tonight, which we haven't done for the last three days. And um, we could buy some black stuff for his room. It's a good idea. So I sort of, we eventually found him and he turned up at home and took out his head from. Uh! I said, you know, we're going to go to IKEA. Uh! So we went off to IKEA and um, within an hour of being in IKEA, it didn't go very well. And his hood was on, his headphones were in. and. And I sort of went up to him and said, you know, what's the problem? You know, he says, yeah, but it's all too colourful here. There's nothing in black. So essentially, it wasn't a very good decision. So I was sort of sitting on the floor, very despondent, and thinking, you know, uh, I was actually sort of not necessarily crying with my bleeding hands, but on the verge of. And then my youngest daughter came up to me and again, very laterally said, oh, dad, dad, look what I found. And she found this long brush with a sucker thing on the end of it. And she says, do you remember when we were babies, we used to sit with you in the bathroom, we used to stick them on your head and hit them from side to side. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And she said, well, do you mind? So she stuck one on my head. And, <laughs> and before I knew it, a whole load of other kids come. And I had more than 20 brushes sitting on my head, not having really a care in the world or anything, sitting on the floor of a care. And guess who comes up around the corner? My son comes up, takes his hat off, takes his headphone out, gets out his iPhone and makes a picture of me. Don't think anything about it. Three days later, still no contact, until all of a sudden, one evening, the door slams, bang, and bang, 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 upstairs to my study and screaming, dad, 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 dad. Dad and I started panicking, thinking, oh, Jesus, something's happened to mom, you know, every, you know, the nuclear holocaust, whatever. And he says, dad, 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 dad. And he's completely out of breath, and he gets out his iPhone, and he, look, 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 look. And I'm sort of looking at his iPhone, going, yes. And he shows me this picture. And he'd written underneath the perks of being bald and bored in Ikea. And that's a sort of a play on the name of a film that was very popular with teenagers recently. And he'd posted it on a site called Nine Gag. And he got one and a half million likes in three days. <laughs> I promise you, one and a half million. Not only one and a half million likes, thousands of letters from around the world, from everybody from Vancouver to... It's just, the whole world is getting in touch with me. Everybody wants to know this. And it's this teenage site. It's about humor. And he says, please, please, I need to ask you a massive favor. And I'm going, yeah, anything, anything, you know, are we communicating? Great, great, great. He says, the whole of my class wants to meet you and they want to have, come and have supper tomorrow because they want you and me, we're now this team, to help them get one and a half million likes when they post something. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. So the next night we've got 35 kids all sitting around the table, 35 teenagers, and my son sitting next to me, very proudly looking at me, having this discussion about how to be liked in social media. Um, <laughs> the story being, and I think I quite enjoy sharing it, is here we go, um, here I am, and I'm standing here, you know, talking about communicating with cannibals and taking their picture in Papua New Guinea and being very proud that I can do it. But when it actually really matters, communicating with your own family, who I've spent a long time away from in the last few years, it, things can sometimes go pear-shaped. And the only way to really, really do that, it's all about humor and it's all about empathy and it's all about how I see myself and how I see you and how we can reconnect in those ways. So to be honest, that's the essence of what I'm doing. It's not rocket scientists. Uh, there's no great depth to it, but it's all about visual communication. And the fact that the whole world has become a photographer, it's the world's first ever global language, which everybody understands. There are three billion pictures being uploaded online every day at the moment. Three billion pictures. 
Everybody is taking pictures. My children attach GoPros to our dogs. It's an amazing perspective. Animals are making pictures. So it's something we all understand and we're all doing. So I want to share what this picture is with you. And this picture is not my favorite picture, but a colleague of mine says it's very important to show it. And I said, why? But it's of this Nainit and the Yamal in northern Siberia. She said, but if you look closely into the picture, there's a picture of you. It's not a very good version with a projector, but there's a very clear reflection in his eye of me taking his picture. And she says, perhaps that's symbolic that you've etched yourself on his soul as much as they've become etched in my soul. And I think that's the antithesis of what I'm to communicate. I'm not sure what this all means in the greater scheme of things, but it has etched itself in my soul. And by sharing these pictures with you, I hope I in some way touch you and you can apply it to however you so please. Thank you. Again, this is only the beginning, so we need to have a discussion now. Right. Yeah, of course. Oh. Right. Um, there, there's another, there's can I start? Yeah, there's another, um, I'm just thinking on the top of my head. Again, an example of how you, why I believe this matters is, um, it only happened uh, last week, and I don't have any pictures about it. Somebody rang me, uh, and they said, Jimmy, 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 we've seen your book, and can you help me? And I said, yeah, yeah, sure. She said, well, I need a family picture. And I said, yeah, you know, that's what I do, and I cost this much, and I'm free on this and this and this. And she said, well, no, 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 it's not going to quite work like that. Um, uh, she was about 17, and she said, I don't have any money. And uh, I said, okay, that's a bit of a problem, because this is my living. You know, I don't just you know, travel halfway across. Hall. She said, yeah, but I think it, you may be interested. My grandfather is about to die. And he's, in two days, three days' time, we're going to give him morphine, because he, he's got cancer. And I dream of having a family picture with all, and it was a family about as big as this room, with grandpa in the middle. We've never had a picture like this. And would that interest you? And I started thinking, yeah, this is sort of, yeah. And the emotion and the, the pictures that you make, that's what I would like in my own family. But there's another technical problem. She says, we all hate each other. <laughs> never once have we all 30 of us ever come together. But I think, and hearing your stories, the way you work, perhaps you would like to help me realize this. So I got very excited and said, yeah, this is exactly what I'm trying to do by keeping that balance, by using these pictures as a catalyst for how we see and we can connect with each other. So I went, I arrived in this farm somewhere in Enschede, and a very strange place, and I sort of arrived and speaking my bad Dutch, and lots of people running around grumbling and smoking, and coffee needs to say, for that little kitty, you know. I said, yeah, okay, no, uh, hi, I'm Jimmy, and uh, I'm here for this picture. Yeah, the Vilivini, the, 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 the Vilivini. I said, well, it's okay, it's okay, calm down, calm down, calm down. So grandpa's in. One thing, we're going to have to hurry up. He's about to die. It's very Dutch, it's very direct. And he started laughing. <coughs> and, said, da, 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 da. and then he said, uh, and the other things, we're going to make this family picture. And, but and there's a technical problem. I forgot uh, my lens. I've only got one lens, and it's a standard lens. That so means everybody's got to come together. So if you imagine, I'm like, everybody's got to come in and sit around grandpa. So that started it. So everybody became very uncomfortable. And I said, next to that, uh, you all have to touch each other, and I have to all see your hands. And if you don't do that, I'm not going to press the shutter. But I don't have to press the shutter because you're not paying me. It's a very weird experience. <laughs> it, took, it took about half an hour, and then eventually they all came in. They end, all ended up holding each other, holding hands, and I made the picture. Very tacky, not a very technically good picture. And they all started to cry. This was about a week ago. I only went back two days ago, and the grandfather died. And we sat down, we had supper together, and they all said thank you for, we thanked the, the young lady who was 16, for helping us reconnect and refine each other. And in actual fact, we do love each other. We are a family. We've completely forgotten how to communicate. So perhaps that is a way of continually keeping this balance. And if you take it out of the anthropological context, it's just how we see each other. Yeah? Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening.